All right. It is 3 o'clock. Time to start my timer. You all got 45 minutes of me today. I'm going to try to blaze through a lot of content. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about the intersection of human ingenuity and automated efficiency. Got some people trickling in, so I'll get a slow start here. Let everyone get their seats taken. Um, I am Brandon. They'll have a slide about me in a second about who I am and what I do. But before we get started, I got to show this slide. Download the Whoove app. If you don't already have it, you're slacking. <laughs> I'm going to leave these QR codes up for just a second here. If you don't already have it, download it. You can RSVP for all your sessions. Um, you can chat with people on there. There's a whole community. It's pretty sweet. Uh, but who am I? I'm Brandon. Uh, I am doing two things now. I started off as a uh, technician at ETOP Technology. Uh, we are a, oops, I clicked the wrong button. There we go. <laughs> we are a MSP based out in Southern California. Uh, I am the senior IT manager there, so I handle a lot of the more strategic decisions, big escalations. Uh, if people can't figure it out, it lands on my desk. <laughs> Recently, I did also start as a founding partner of Zentop Consulting. Uh, we have been doing automation for our MSP for a few years now. Uh, we started with Roost right when they very first started out. So we have a lot of content we've built, and we have a lot of experience in it. Talking with other MSPs, a lot of people want to get started in the automation space, but they don't know where to start. We help you guys develop your own automations, um, define your processes, get everything up to shape, and ideally hand you off to yourselves to carry on the torch forward, just getting all over that initial hump. But this isn't a sales discussion. If you want one of those, find me after. <laughs> um, outside of work, though, I enjoy making music, building software and electronics. I got a whole bunch of 3D printers. I can't go to Micro Center unsupervised because I will leave with more 3D printers. <laughs> and as you can tell by the picture, I uh, moonlight as a part-time mountain goat. <laughs> So let's get started off. Before we get into the fun stuff with the automation, we need to figure out what we are doing first by defining our process. So what is our goals with automation? We want to have consistent application of process, which leads into repeatability. You want something to run over and over and over again and make sure that it is happening the exact same way every single time. That consistency leads to huge gains, uh, both for ease of use for your technicians, uh, time saved, and security. People don't consider a security boost, they think of time-saving consistency, but as you start to pull more tasks off of the end technician, you can start pulling permissions out. When we're pulling a lot of 365 actions out of the GDAP portals and SIP and pulling them into automations that are running and that can be triggered from our PSA, we don't need to give technicians GDAP access anymore, so we can start pulling their permissions back. The only application that needs access is our automation platform at that point. So with these goals in mind, how do we reach them? So before we do anything, we need to know what it is we're going to do. So you have to define the process. Yeah, I know it sounds basic, um, but write it down. Being in your head doesn't count. I don't care where you write it down, on a napkin, preferably in your uh, documentation platform, but just get it out of your head and somewhere where you can run it and iterate on it. So no, seriously, define it. You know you want to. Uh, evaluate how the humans do it. Watch someone on your service desk do the process. One of the things I often do for consulting is I'll just start up a Teams meeting and say, just do this for me. I'm gonna record this, I'm gonna write everything down. You don't have to go too super deep to figure out what you're doing, but you wanna figure out how long it takes on average for someone to do the process. If you're going to measure the success of something you are automating, you need to know what that metric looks like. Um, otherwise, you're just automating for the sake of automation, which, don't get me wrong, it's fun, but Typically, someone wants to have some sort of return on investment for the time they're putting into this stuff. Uh, is there any improvements you can make to the process as well? You'd be surprised how many times you're doing something just in your head, and you don't realize you're missing a step, uh, or you don't realize that you could do something a little bit differently until you actually actualize that process and write it down somewhere. And most importantly, find the hidden sub-processes. These are things you need to do while you're completing your task to get to the end goal. These are things that are super ripe for automation because these are the super repeatable processes that you can pull out and then go ahead and use in other automations later down the line. So next question I often get is, is it even worth it to automate it? Well, you get a base bonus when you start automating something. You get consistency. You put the best technician you have in your team in front of a computer, tell them to do one task 100 times over. One of those 100 times, two, three, they're going to miss a step. It's just human. We've all forgotten to hit save on a configuration and refresh the page and no longer had that configuration anymore. <laughs> it, it happens. Uh, so with automation, one really big bonus is you know that when you tell the computer you're gonna do something this way, these same three steps over and over, it's not gonna forget. So 
with that in mind, ask yourself, when do you want to see ROI on this process from a time standpoint? Do you want short-term ROA? This is like three months in, simple, high-frequency tasks, quick wins, very short things. Or do you want more mid-term ROI? This is like six months out, uh, complex, low-frequency tasks, significant long-term benefits. So some examples here. I keep hitting the wrong button. Top one. There we go. I'm very excited about this new clicker. It's so cool. I hope you guys think it's cool, too. <laughs> uh, but short-term ROI. So three months. These are things like resetting passwords, adding users to groups, which is foreshadowing. Remember that. <laughs> Midterm, long-term ROI. These are larger processes, like onboarding computers, um, onboarding users, multiple sub-processes making up one larger one. Because you're considering you're making multiple processes to get to a larger process, you want to give yourself a little bit more time to figure that out. So leads into, is it a sub-workflow? So let's do some numbers. Break-even time in months times time saved to ex estimate executions. So what does this look like? We want a short-term ROI. Every time we do this task, we save about 30 seconds. And we do this about five times a week. So bear with me here. <laughs> five times 12, that's going to get us the amount of times we expect to do that task in the three-month period. 0.5 is half a minute bring that down, and that gives us 90 minutes of dev time. We have a budget now. We can ask ourselves, will this take about 90 minutes for us to finish? If it is, then we can say, OK, that's about how much time we're going to save over three months. We're going to hit ROI on this three months. If we do it in less time, that's even better. We hit our ROI even sooner. So a lot of math. I'm going to give you a break with an obligatory quote slide. You can't automate a process that doesn't exist, spoken by Aaron, do you have any IPAs? Sure, and the CEO of Roost, also known as Bigfoot. So let's talk about our process that we are going to end up automating. Our client has a new 365 group in Microsoft for automation engineers. We need to add all of the existing users and new users to this new group. So if user has job title, automation engineer, add to group with this ID. That's it. That's the whole process. That's all you need to write out. This is your blueprint for what you're going to be doing next. So let's talk about our time investment now. About two minutes to fix all users. We'll say about a minute to get into the admin portal, 30 minutes to find it, 30 minutes for the admin portal to actually load everything we need to see in it. I could go through and just say, OK, it's going to take 50 seconds per user to find it, look at the job title and do it. But more realistically, we'd use a filter. We just hit the filter button in the top right of users in the 365 admin type in the job title, select all. So about another 30 seconds to do that, and then apply the new group. All in all, two minutes. Let's run it through that exact same scenario. Um, oh, before we do that, we're going to go ahead and talk about the ongoing time savings. We'll say when we're making a new user, it takes about 15 minutes, or 15 seconds, to add this group when we're making the user. So short-term ROI on this. It's a short process. Now that we have that number, we can start doing our math. So break-even time in months times time saved, estimated executions. So our example, here's our numbers, three month ROI, 30 seconds saved, done three times per week. So that should say 15. The math is right, the number is wrong. So um, we're gonna do it three times 12 times, so over that period we're gonna save about 36 tasks. We're gonna multiply that by order of a minute, 15 seconds. And then we're gonna add two to that because that's our initial time saving to go through and fix everyone who's already in there. Go out to that, and we get a 33-minute budget. I think I can do this in 33 minutes. I'm confident I can, because I'm going to show you in the next about 33 minutes what this would look like to automate with some steps along the way. So OK, we have a process. We know how long we can spend on it. We think it's worth it to do this. So let's plot out the automation. Uh, but we're not quite ready to start yet. We've got to scaffold this. So a human runnable process is not quite to the point of an automatable process. The more prep work you do, the better. The worst thing you can do from a time savings metric is constantly change the workflow you are in the middle of building. So we're going to start simple. We're going to have a begin. We're going to have an end. First step we need to do, get a job title. Then we need to make sure, OK, is this user in the group of users that we want to add to this new 365 group? So we could just apply it. And if it fails, oh well. But I want to be a little clean with this, so I'm going to make sure that out of the list of users out of this group, they're not already in this group. So we're going to check if they're already assigned. And then if they aren't, 
Then we'll assign the group, and we can get to the end. But hold on a sec. We forgot something. This is just for one user. This is not going over everyone in the tenant. If I were to run this, I can just plug in one user ID, and it would work. But this is awesome, because we just found our first subprocess. Not just anyone, a repeatable subprocess. How many times do you think you can use this for other customers who want a similar task done when your inputs are asking for a user ID, an attribute to match in its value, and the groups to assign? So we're going to bring it all together. We're going to make a master workflow that's going to call this prior subprocess. So we're going to start with the beginning. We're going to list all of the users and all of their job titles. We're going to loop through. We're going to run that subprocess for every single one of them. And then we're going to come to an end. So right on time, enough of the concepts. We're going to take a look at what this actually looks like. But where exactly are we planning on building this? There's a lot of options. I use Roost. You don't have to use Roost. I would prefer if you used it. But I'm not paid by Roost. So some people prefer fully custom workflows, stuff like PowerShell, uh, where they are programming their own automation platform essentially from scratch. That works fine. Some people like Power Automate somewhere in the middle. Some people like Roost myself included. Some people like Pia. Some people like ConnectWise's option, Kaseya's option. What you're looking for is criteria to make sure that it's going to match what you want to do. So you want to make sure, first off, it's multi-tenant. If you're going to plan to use this for all of your customers, you don't want to be either recreating it from scratch in every single one of your tenants or copy-pasting the workflow out of one tenant into the next one into the next one. After that, you want to make sure, does this actually integrate with what I need? Microsoft has a great API called Graph. If you're not familiar with it, look it up. It's pretty awesome. Roost makes things a little bit easier because they give us these pre-built building blocks. Um, but you can go ahead and, no matter what your platform is, make an API call out. And you also want to make sure that you have the freedom to build what you want to build. There's a lot of new automation companies I'm seeing pop up. And they are starting off with, you're going to use our process, which is fine. I tell a lot of people. If all you're looking for is the end result for basic things like making new users, go for it. They've already done the work for you. But you're going to reach a point eventually where you're going to have your own custom conditions, where you're going to need to plug in. This customer has this specific process for how they want their groups handled, how they want their licenses handled, how we should treat them in our PSA depending on their, um, like whatever subscription plan they're using for you guys. So you want to make sure down the line you're not going to run into a point where it's like, I want to do more of this, but I can't. I am fully holed in to whatever the vendor wants me to do here. So with that being said, we're going to continue on with Roost, because this is what I'm using. <laughs> Let's start off by building our sub-workflow. Before we do everything, we're going to start with a defined beginning, and we're going to start with a defined number of inputs. Going back a little bit, those inputs are going to be the job title and the user ID. Small. Let me see if I can zoom in for y'all. No, nope, I can't. Oh, yes, I can. This is so cool. <laughs> so we have user ID and job title. So once we have those inputs, now we got to do something with them. We're going to actually get the user out of it. So in Roost, you'll see this format here. This is Jinja. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. Uh, but these brackets are essentially saying, give me something back. CTX means it's a variable and that's user ID. So we're asking for the input we put into it. Out of that API request, I want to go ahead and select job title. So we got that. Now we've got to figure out what we're going to do with it. So these are transitions. A few different paths we can take here. We can go and we can update the groups. We can say, no updates needed. They're already assigned to the group. We run into some sort of API error or something we have no idea what's going to happen has happened. We can't account for it quite yet. So in a transition, these are just conditional paths based on outcome. You can take one or many paths, but try to plan for as much as you can. Plan to fail safely. When I talk about error handling and workflows, if a workflow ends up with an error, that's not a problem with the service I'm running or the process. That's a problem with the workflow itself. It means something has happened that I haven't accounted for, and it's now up to me to go back and add accounting for that. So we're going to jump into here, and we have some code here. This code basically says, for this get user task, the result out of that, get the value of job title, and see if it matches the input we gave it. This is for update groups. So that code was Jinja. 
not this one. Jinja is a templating language. Uh, it's used to generate dynamic output based on a set of varying inputs. Uh, it's based off of Python. It's not exactly Python, but it's pretty darn close if you're used to it. Um, you could easily compare and manipulate data based on templates. We'll get to manipulating it in just a second, but it ensures accurate and repeatable outputs. So let's break down this template. We have tasks, get user. This is saying select the task we have for get user. Result of the task, we have two of them here because that's just how Microsoft spits it out. <laughs> and then we're selecting the attribute out of that task, job title. Does this match the job title we're putting in that we want to match? If it does, then we're good to go. Um, with that, we can move on to the next condition here. So no updates needed. We're doing essentially the same thing. So we're pulling the attribute we get out of the API back. We're saying, does it not equal job title? And if so, we're going to take this conditional path because that's not what we're looking for to change. Next up, we got API errors. There's a lot of different status codes you can get out of HTTP. I'm gonna go over just kind of a high level of them. You can have codes that start with one. That means, hold on. Two, 200, awesome, success. Here you go, all yours. 300s, go away. This is like if you're trying to redirect somewhere else. You're not looking for me, you're looking for that guy over there. 400 means you screwed up. This is a bad request. You're not authorized to do this. You're asking for something that I don't have. And 500s, I screwed up. Server had a problem. Doesn't know what to do. Knowing these codes, you can then make more transitions depending on what you're expecting. If something you're expecting to happen is maybe the user doesn't exist yet, then you can look for a 404 response code and take a different path. It may not complete still, but then you can give additional information to the human who can take a next step and say, okay, you need to go debug this because the user doesn't exist yet. Have you made them? Did we miss a step? Is there anything we can put back into this automation to prevent this from happening again? So, okay, now we know we have the user information. We make sure that they are the user we want to modify. And now we need to go ahead and list groups, list the members in the group that we're looking for because we wanna make sure that we're not already assigned to this and we're gonna give ourselves an, a failure condition out of the gate. So we're gonna look for the group ID of the group ID we're putting in. And out of that, I wanna select the ID. So some more ginger here. We'll break it down a little bit, but we have user ID in, and then we have something new here. We're looking at the results, but we have this little pipe going into something called map attribute ID. So that's a filter, our first filter. They're pretty cool. They're functions in a templating language that allow you to modify and manipulate variables before they're rendered and spat back out at you. You can change the format of data's in, you can extract specific information, you can do really whatever you want with it. So they're typically applied to variables using the pipe symbol and you can chain them together multiple times over. If I wanna map several layers deep, I can put as many maps on there as I want. So let's talk about what this actually does. So here's an example of what our data looks like. We have a list of objects containing ID, an ID number, and then we have this OData type. This comes out of Microsoft by default, just tells you what kind of data am I expecting to get back here, user. We don't care about this. All we care about is the ID. We wanna make sure that the user ID we're putting in is not in this response, because if it is, they're already in the group. We're gonna run a request to add them, and it's not gonna do anything. At best, at worst, it'll give us an error. So we're gonna go ahead and pipe that in to map, and we're gonna map to the attribute ID. What that does is it says, okay, out of all these objects, just get the ID and then spit them back as just a list of results. This is something we can check for when we use in. So this is going to respond with either a true or a false. Is user ID in the response out of this, this that list of numbers we got? True. The transition is looking for a truthy or falsely result. So by running that, that basically checks. Is the user ID in this list of groups? So let's see if it's not assigned. It's the exact same thing, but backwards. We're gonna say not in. So this is where we're gonna go ahead and take the path we wanna take. And then of course, again, we have error, which is an API error that we haven't accounted for, or something that we have no idea what's gonna come. 
So, perfect. Last up, we have gotten our user information. We've gotten the information of their uh, job title to make sure that it is something that we want to modify. We get the information out of the group we're gonna add them in. We've made sure that they're not already in that group. So now we just need to add group member. This task has two simple inputs. Which group do you want to add it in? Group ID. Which user is it? User ID. And then we're gonna do a whole lot more. <laughs> this looks like a lot has been done, but all we've done is connected all these steps together. So I'm gonna break it down. Let me see how big that is. Can everyone see? Do I need to zoom in on that at all? All right. Do I still have the big magnifier? All right, we're gonna switch this to the bullet point. Sweet. So we're gonna start, we're gonna get user. We need to update the group. We're gonna list the group members. Not yet assigned, we're gonna assign. What we have is we're taking the errors and the unhandles and we're putting them into another action here called report error. This is going to be an actionable path for us not to fail the workflow because we've accounted for these errors happening and we're gonna do something about it. We have another task here which if they are not in the right group or the groups already been assigned to them, we just say, all good, this does nothing and then it just passes it out to the end. So let's talk about handling our errors now. So we're gonna go ahead and add a data alias. This just lets us put information into something I could reference later on, so a variable called error, and we're going to give information that the human that's gonna look at this when it fails can go back to and know what happened. API error getting user from graph for user ID. It's really all we need up front. Of course, as time goes on, you're going to want to add more and more context to these errors. When you get a 404 response, you're gonna say, okay, 404 means not found. I'm gonna change this error message. I'm gonna make a new transition that's looking for 404, and then we're gonna to add to the message, user not found. Is there any step we can add? Can we add another check to make sure the user exists first? Probably. If that fails, do we need to make the user, or do we need to kick it back to the person entering information into the form to say, you filled this out wrong? Depends on where you're starting from. So there's two types of errors on that note. You have terminating errors. The workflow can't continue. Uh, this is when like a required variable isn't returned. Uh, if a action required for a downstream check doesn't work, uh, so for example, a creation of a group to assign users to later fails. Uh, these are things where if it happens, you can't continue. You gotta stop, you gotta let someone know. But we also have non-terminating workflows. The workflow can continue. This is just something you can log and say, hey, by the way, this didn't work. So if you have one step out of a 20-step process, it doesn't prevent the user from logging in. There's something we need to do for them, like sending contact information. We can just put in a note in our PSA that says, hey, this step failed. You should go look at it, but we did the rest of it. So just add this one thing we missed and then let the automation expert know, you need to go fix this now. So when we wanna report this out, this is our specific error reporter. So we got a few inputs here. Sender, just where it's coming from. Recipient, in this case me. Subject, workflow error. Something broke, see the details. Terminating error occurred. And then in the body, we're referencing that error we have here. So the error information we filled out error earlier is being put into this email, sent up to me. We have another pipe going into another filter that says D, which is if this isn't defined, use this as a default. Error not logged. So even if something goes wildly wrong and we reach this path without having any context of what the error is, we're still accounting for that and we're letting us know terminating error still occurred and we have no idea what it is. This is super broken. You really need to take a look at that. Uh, but let's go ahead and test. So this is our sub workflow. So we're going to be putting in the information of just one user here. And you can see this is taking a path. I know the color contrast may not be perfect, but we'll follow along here. So begin, we get a green arrow. Get user, update groups. Perfect, got that done. List group members, awesome, that's all good. And we've evaluated that it's not yet been assigned. We're going to add a group member. Perfect, no error codes on response. And we're done. Second option, that could still be a success. We got our begin, we're gonna go to get user. It's the right user, but they're already in the group. Or up here, they're a user, but they don't have the right job title. So we're gonna take a path down to all good, and we're gonna go to end. We're skipping over this step, but it's still being evaluated as a, as a success because we're accounting for these conditions. So once we have that done, we got a few more steps here. We're gonna start our master workflow. 
this is what's gonna go through and actually give us the master list of users we're gonna check this on. And here's how we're gonna use our sub workflow. So we're gonna start, we're gonna get a list of all users, we're gonna run for each user, and then we're gonna end it. So when we want to run things under multiple different contexts, this is something you should be able to do in every platform. This is just how Roost does it. You have data aliases, we went over this a little bit, and this alias is going to be a list of user IDs. We're filtering this just the same as we did before for the groups, but instead of IDs for groups, IDs of users. Once we have this in a list object, we can do a with items loop. So in the advanced tab of the editor for Roost, we have a with items field. We're gonna pipe in our list there, and then we're gonna say item. And this is going to run that workflow for every single item in the list, every single user ID. The information we're putting into the sub workflow we're looking for is automation engineer. And the group ID they should be in is this. So this information is gonna stay static. It's not gonna change. The user ID is, so we can iterate quickly through all of the users at once, and we could run this simultaneously. We don't have to check one user and wait, do another user and wait. We can run this as many times as we want all at once. So let's see how that looks like. We have a good path here. Begin, list users, we got our list, we filtered it, we're taking the path down to use uh, assign user to group. We're gonna loop through that, this little loop icon, and then for each of those here, we're gonna go out to the end, and then we have a report errors if either of these steps fail. Once we have that, we take a look at our test. All of these users ran simultaneously. You can see this took, let's see, 0 0.03 seconds. <laughs> 0.69, 1.13, I think the most was 3.62, uh, and they're all happening simultaneously. So by four seconds in, we have checked every single user in this tenant, and we're done. And we can add this on as a task for a user onboarding workflow, so now we know this is gonna happen every single time after that. I am 60 seconds ahead, but I wanna leave a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. Um, before we get to the Q&A, I wanted to end off, thanks to all our sponsors. Bruce is on there, just saying. <laughs> if you guys wanna get in touch with me afterwards, you got that QR code up there. I spent a little bit of time making that, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, you can go ahead and scan that, that'll get you to my LinkedIn. Uh, it'll get you out to uh, contact information for me. If you wanna book a meeting to chat, don't wanna talk sales, I'm always happy to ramble about automation as I have done for the past 30 minutes. But with that, these talks often get a lot of questions. I wanted to leave ample time at the end. This can be anything you want to ask, either about what we talked about or just your automation journey. Where do you start? How do you find processes? Um, what if you're trying to debate on if you want to automate this or not, it's a good idea. I'm here for you. <laughs> There's a microphone up there. I don't know if it's turned on or not, but feel free to come on up, don't be shy. If no one wants to, then I can keep talking and fill the space, but anyone got any questions? If not, this will be the first one where no one has a question. The lights are very bright also, so if you're raising your hand and I can't see you, I think I see someone back there. Most likely not. So I know Roos uses Jinja, it's based off of Python. Um, they're probably not going to be using the same templating language over at Pia. They're definitely not for Power Automate. Um, and of course you can do your own stuff with PowerShell and C Sharp. The end goal of these languages are going to be roughly the same. You're gonna take data, you're gonna filter through it, you're gonna do something with it, and you're gonna get a specific output. So different ways to skin a cat. Um, Jinja, I like it because I'm used to Python, so it kind of clicked for me, um, but it depends. It's the best answer in IT, it depends. <laughs> I got a question over here, and I'll come to the front. Yes. It does, there's a lot of work in the Roost community in particular of training uh, custom GPT models to spit out Jinja. Uh, if you are doing that, one thing you wanna make sure you tell it is don't give this to me in Python. ChatGPT loves to say, I can't do this in Jinja, but you can do it in Python and give you something else. And then you tell it, I don't have Python, and it goes, okay, here you go, here's it in Jinja. <laughs> so you wanna kinda engineer your problems just a little bit, uh, make sure you're getting the right outputs, but yes, there are a lot of people who use ChatGPT to work this out. Typically it's just the code. Um, so like I'll put in, like I'll run it up to that point and I'll get the output. So I'm like, here's the API output I have and here's what I want to get out of it. Write me a template that can get there. I think there's a question up front here.
Yeah, so I have just been recently starting to work on this. I think everyone in this room here is probably familiar with SIP by now. SIP can actually fire off webhooks based on alerts. So we can start doing some really cool things with that where if SIP is detecting a risky user login, if it detects a VPN usage, if it uses its own database to look at these things up and it says, hey, something sketchy here, you can have that fire webhook off into Roost to do something. Probably faster than a user can get it into the help desk as an email, triage it, take an action. SIP actually does have actions built into their alerts to run their BEC flow as well. Um, but cybersecurity is just noisy. If you're looking for one specific thing, you know you're looking for it, you can filter through logs really quickly. And you can just fire these workflows off as many times as you want. We have one that actually runs a pod in our ConnectWise managed tickets that uh, will give options to users. And every time a ticket record is saved, it runs the workflow. So we're doing a whole lot of executions and the platform doesn't care. So if you want to hook that up to like a log ingestion for any logs at like a medium or higher risk level, you want to be careful you're not totally overloading it. Uh, but if you're looking for medium logs with a very specific criteria, you can feed that into the platform and start taking different actions. The really cool thing about RPAs is it's gluing platforms together. I just talked about Graph today because it's just one simple platform. But with that, you can actually go ahead and start having it talk to your PSA, talk to your RMM. Um, you can make the alert from Graph fire something off into the PSA. Think of your RPA tools kind of like the conductor for an orchestra for all your different platforms. I got a question right over there. Ooh, good question. When do you determine something is a process that shouldn't be automated? I think it kind of comes down to, think of the, the initial slides up front with that ROI equation. Figure out about how much time, how much time do I have before I want to start getting results on it, and how much time am I going to save in that window? If you're gonna spend far more time um, automating it, then you're gonna see results. It may not be a process you wanna automate, but not one just yet. Still keep that process, keep it in your little folder. You might come back to it later on and realize this is part of a larger process I have now. Now I can justify spending the time to automate this as a sub workflow. Um, I can say personally, I have kind of gone off the rails and automated stuff just because it was fun to do so. <laughs> you could call it a learning opportunity because you're figuring out new things and that's how you can justify it. But um, I will say there are certain cases where you can get into it and maybe you did do the ROI math up front and it seemed like it was gonna be easy and it wasn't and you can pull the plug. I know the sunk cost fallacy is really popular in IT circles where it's like I put so much time to this already, I gotta finish it, I gotta finish it. But um, there is a certain point we have to say, you know what, I am twice over my budget for this. I'm not making any headway. Let's come back to it later. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, we are running a little bit ahead. I'm about 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Um, if there is nothing else, I will let you guys take a little extended break, but feel free to come find me after the talk here. I'll be walking around for the next two days. Uh, I'm here all the way up till Thursday. You'll see me walking around. Come say hi. I don't bite. <laughs> but thank you everyone for coming. Hope you got something out of it.